ahead and we'll call today's uh, trustee meeting. And today is April 27th, 2015. We have a regular trustee meeting. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have an agenda before us. Is there, are there any additions, changes, modifications? Yep, make a motion to approve the agenda as presented. I'm going to make uh, one, or I'm sorry, uh, two additions if I can. Um, one is uh, under zoning, just to add uh, discussion about rescheduling the zoning hearing scheduled for this Thursday. And then under finance, um, I don't know if everybody got this letter or if it just came to me. So this uh, Josh Mandel, Ohio checkbook, oh, open checkbook just plan. some discussion about open checkbook, essentially. Cool. Otherwise, yeah, under finance, I guess, or under fiscal officer, whichever way we want to have it, or under trustee, I don't care. Let's do it under finance. Yeah. So. Otherwise, no, no, no additional. Good. We'll stop to second. Second. Mr. Paxton. Yes. Mr. Kratz. Yes. Okay, make a motion to approve the bills or the payroll. Payroll in amount of two hundred fifty-eight thousand three hundred ninety-five dollars and forty-nine cents. Second. Mr. Paxton. Yes. Mr. Kratz. Yes. Move to approve the bills in the amount of one hundred seventy-three thousand six hundred dollars and forty-one cents. Second. Mr. Paxton. Yes. Mr. Kretz. Yes. Move to approve the minutes for the regular meeting held April thirteenth, two thousand and fifteen. Um, did the I can't remember what change I asked to be made, unless I go back through my emails. I don't know if you modified that or not. Yep. You did. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Second. Mr. Paxton. Yes. Mr. Kretz. Yes. This time, open it up to any citizens desiring to speak. Seeing none, we'll move on. Uh, we have no old business, no new business. Um, move on to the administrator. Uh, thank you, board. I have a resolution here for a zoning commission appointment uh, due to the vacancy that uh, was previously passed on to the board. Um, uh, from one of our zoning board members, we are moving Mr. Bob Geis, who was originally appointed as an alternate uh, September 16th of 2013 to a permanent uh, position on the zoning board. Um, and we currently have some applications that have been pooled um, for some alternate positions to fill the position on the zoning commission, but they have not been submitted back as of yet. Okay. <clears throat> um, I'll make that motion for the repeated resolution. Um, recommendation by Alex to approve Robert Geist to fill in for the unexpired term of Woodrow Willis uh, until March 30th, 2018, or until a suitable replacement is appointed. Second. Mr. Paxton. Yes. Mr. Kratz. Yes. Uh, thank you, board. The next item in your packet is the Frank Gates uh, third party administrator uh, for the township uh, invoice. Uh, it's in your packet on page number four. Uh, this is cost allocated through the departments uh, for uh, handling our um, Bureau of Workman's Comp cases. Um, the, the cost is $17,216 for the administrative fee. Uh, that is same as last year. Uh, some of the things that we're looking at uh, that Ms. Gustafson's been working with uh, Frank Gates on is um, we are still in group, um, which is good for us uh, because if we weren't in group, the cost for the township would be $124,000 roughly um, for us to handle the BWC claim. So we are in group, so the group rating, uh, group premium savings for that, uh, for us as a township to stay in the group is about 88,000. And we're anticipating um, a savings, projective savings this year of $36,000. Uh, our claims 
are up just a little bit, but yet um, we've been able to manage uh, our cases pretty well. What keeps us in group, Alex? The uh, amount of claims? Amount of claims and the and the cost of the claims. Cost of the claims and amount of claims. Okay. Um, I make the motion that we. Um, this is an annual fee. An annual, yes. Oh. Yeah. This this would essentially be for fifteen and um, sixteen part sixteen. Okay. So if we uh, approve the. Um, the amount of seventeen thousand two hundred sixteen dollars. Frank Gates. Um, Karen works. Karen works co uh, compensation uh, for two thousand and fifteen and two thousand and sixteen. Second. Mr. Paxson. Yes. Mr. Kretz. Yes. Thank you, board. The next item in the packet is the sheriff's uh, biweekly report. Uh, if there are any questions, any noticeable spikes or uh, concerns to point uh, out? Nothing. After meeting with uh, a couple of the homeowners associations, there were a few complaints about uh, uh, speeding complaints in some of the neighborhoods. We've uh, passed that on to the sheriff's office, and they have uh, stepped up patrol in those areas. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, board. Next item on the agenda is the Ohio Ethics Commission training. Uh, as, as you guys are aware, the, uh, the Investment Advisory Committee, a part of the policy that was passed by the Township Trustees, uh, recommends or doesn't recommend, it requires that they uh, complete Ohio Ethics Commission training. Uh, the dates for the Ohio Ethics Commission training is Wednesday, May 13th. Uh, there will be two sessions that day, uh, one at 2.30, um, and that will be for anyone who chooses to show up because uh, we sent the invitation um, to all our boards, uh, including our zoning and a board of zoning and appeals, um, and it is open as well to the elected officials um, to attend. Uh, it is a requirement for battalion chiefs up to department heads to attend uh, one of the two meetings or um, the Ohio Ethics Commission is allowing us to videotape it as well. Um, so we'll be able to rebroadcast it for anyone who's not able to make it due to vacation or, or uh, any other leave. The second session is scheduled Wednesday, the same day, May 13th at 5.30. Um, so either session you can attend. Uh, it is a great class. I've been through it uh, twice now at the OTA and uh, the same speaker if you've had an opportunity to sit through the class while attending the conference. It's the same speaker that's done both sessions I've been through. So those are the dates. Uh, like I said, it's required for the Investment Advisory Committee, but uh, the invitation has been sent out to the rest of our boards as well. Any questions on the training? No. Nope. Thank you. Uh, next item on the uh, agenda is just a discussion item is the annual reports. Um, I did send out the uh, reports. I did hear from a few of the elected officials in regards to some changes or typos that were made. Uh, if there's no other questions, I would like to go ahead and post those on our website. I have no. no I have All right. Thank you, board. In your packet on page 11 is an update. Uh, on the uh, project uh, management uh, from the original um, page 11 that was uh, passed on January 21st and then starting on page 12 and 13 is a Gantt chart. And I apologize I did not take out uh, all the way up to 2018 on the <laughs> chart so it does look a little compressed there uh, and that was a conversion issue to PDF. Okay. Any significant concerns as far as uh, items that have been delayed or items that uh, you can move forward, move up? Yeah, we've uh, moved up a few of the items just based on some changes. Uh, one of the uh, items that we're aggressively working on is the US 35 uh, project, uh, which uh, was indicated to be completed later on this year um, due to the uh, collaborative talks between the county, the city of Beaver Creek, and, and city of Xenia. Uh, we're uh, pushing forward with some of those ideas. Um, some of the other projects is, might have been delayed just uh, 
while we get through uh, finishing the implement implementation process for OSL. Uh, so a lot of these uh, are just being kind of projected to be completed next month that were scheduled to be finished either in March or April. So those all should be coming to you in May. Okay. Do you have any questions? No. Okay. Um, and the last item that I have uh, under the administrator section is re to re ask the board to request a special meeting to discuss the US 35 funding. Um, I would like to schedule something uh, next Monday if all possible um, or some, something sometime early next week uh, to update the board on uh, where we're at uh, and our discussions with uh, the county, the city of Beaver Creek and Xenia. I am out of town next week. Okay. Um, when do we need to be? When do we need to get back to the county? Other, other than as soon as possible. Well, as soon as possible, the the, we're, the county is uh, kind of. They are now the official sponsor of the US 35 project, um, and then they would like to know a commitment from all the local jurisdictions about local funding of the right of way access, so that uh, we can complete <coughs> the. the um, track application and then be ready to um, really defend the application in September. Um, obviously, like in my previous discussion, this was something that was going to be in the works for staff to complete um, later on this year. And we're trying to get all this information to the county sure. uh, and get an approval by the board. We, I have, a, uh, we have a trustee meeting the 11th. Um, and uh, under zoning, I was going to request if we could reschedule the zoning hearing for this Thursday the 7th, or I'm sorry, this Thursday the 30th. Um, is it possible to, what, who would be at the US 35 meeting? Would it just be, um, would there be county or ODOT folks there? No, it would just be us. Just be us. Yeah, okay, just, so an internal discussion. Yeah, just internal discussion to see what direction. Okay. Um, and do, is that at a one hour or less? It should be about an hour discussion, mm -hmm. and um, is it possible to is it possible to make Monday a marathon day? I guess is my question, and make uh, put that zoning hearing that evening, and put this thirty five discussion either just prior to that, or Ms. Aaron's you, it doesn't work for you to be before one o'clock, correct? Right, mm -hmm. but. Jim could take me to, he could for the 35 minutes. yeah yeah if you want to start at 12 and then I could just I was gonna say you could, we like could either it. do it at 12 but if it didn't work for you then we could do it no I appreciate it but no that after, would work better for you if you start an hour earlier knowing you at a definitive time would that does that uh, I'm not trying to kill two birds with one stone but we could if we make yeah so that we could do potentially do the 35 meeting at noon if that works for you let me double check here. And then the zoning hearing that evening. Yeah, and that should give us plenty of time for a 10-day notice for the zoning meeting. Or the 35 meeting before the zoning hearing. It doesn't matter to me. As long as I have a 10-day notification period. Right. Yeah, so the 11th should be fine. All right, so we're doing the 11th at 12 o'clock. Is that right? If, that, if, if that works for you. Yeah, that'll work for me. Okay. So we're coming at 12 and meet at 12. And then we're having a zoning. Do we want to do the zoning then at, at 6.30 or so? What's the normal time? 7 or 6.30? 7. 7, seven o'clock. Yeah, the only reason we scheduled the 7.30 was because another Because the conflict. other conflict. Yeah. Right. Okay. So 7 o'clock for the zoning. That's the 7th? That's the 11th. 11th of May okay. for both. And then um, at our 12 o'clock then we'll have roads and zoning? Um, yeah. Just for us, we have a yeah. complete input. Yeah. Okay. To discuss US 35 project. Yes, period. correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, board. Next item on the agenda is the finance department biweekly report. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer them or forward them on. <laughs> I have none. 
Looks like they're busy. Yes. Uh, thank you, board. Next item uh, we already discussed was the workers' comp group rating program renewal, but uh, the, on page 15 is HR's biweekly report. Are there any questions? OSL is fully implemented now. Right now, uh, OSL is uh, we're doing uh, at least two pays um, dual okay. uh, and comparing and making any adjustments. Uh, there were a few just minor errors on permissions uh, this week, so those were actually discovered today and addressed today by OSL. Um, so those are fixed. Um, so it is our goal to implement it at 100% and make sure that everything works <coughs> and matches uh, vacation accrual, sick leave accrual, uh, and the, the match the timesheets and then go 100% to OSL, hopefully in two pays. Okay. 28 days from yeah. the last paper. Right. Okay. And actually, just to let the board know, we actually put... Um, after the last update, we did go two weeks prior uh, and loaded that information and then put all the vacation requests and made sure that it was uh, calculating it correctly to what we originally entered. So, okay. yeah, it will be just longer than 28 days, but we officially uh, started everybody using it that 28 day, first day of the 28 day. How many uh, part time firefighters do we have left to convert? Either seven, eight or seven. Six. Six or seven, okay. Six or seven. And that'll be complete by when? End of this year. The last one finishes in December. Oh, all the way to the end. Yeah. Okay. Uh, most of them finished well before that, but there is one that straggles to the end. Okay. Thank you. Zoning. Thank you, board. Uh, this next uh, item is on page 17 in the zoning. Um, Bi-weekly report. Uh, I will tell you it's been a be busy time period for zoning. Uh, they received 13 just uh, single home, single family dwelling applications last week. Uh, 10, 10 from Bexley Hills and three from Liberty. Um, and we anticipate that number to continue to grow. And as if you can look at the statistics on page 17, we're already uh, past what we were last year. Um, so we're anticipating. <coughs> this season to be very busy not only for our, our zoning department but our road department has implications on inspections as well in, in a lot of the neighborhoods. Liberty is the new Gordon White uh, the patio homes it looks like a nice product I would assume that'll take off pretty quickly can we actually get a fire truck around the end of those cul-de-sacs? Yes <laughs> in fact that is something that uh, every yeah, I'm time sure it went we, we get a site it's plan really yeah good. it's got to be tight it meets its it meets the minimum uh, requirements that the fire department has asked for in, in the call to say minimum, minimum. Yeah. I mean the, the product looks like a very saleable nice product is gonna do well with that, but it just looked like it was there, putting twelve pounds in a ten pound bag. Yeah, access road built to standards that will be reserved and remain open at both ends of the of the dog bone. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Each cul-de-sac will have a dedicated, not dedicated, a secondary access then. Yeah, but, but constructed in a way that'll keep it open. Okay. Not gonna lose it. And human resource-wise and zoning, we're still okay as far as the load we have and that we foresee for the summer and. We're having a ball. Yeah. Good. <laughs> Yeah, it is busy. I, I can tell you that I have seen Mr. Amrine here on the weekends on Saturdays to get caught up on some things when the phones are not ringing or people are not coming in the office. But okay. yes, so is it thirteen on top of the figure you have up there? The no, that's is? an that's an updated figure with the thirteen. The seventeen is. Yeah. Uh, the figure on the is that the single? The no, the forty-nine total applications for this year doesn't include the thirteen. Oh, okay. okay. So those are pending. So our total single family dwelling number for the year is up to 30, and that puts us at the halfway mark of where we were in June of last year. So yeah. we're halfway to our yearly total for last year. And with um, Woodridge, the Sipford development going under 
that, that this secure construction contract and I believe excavation will start there shortly. So we expect a, a flurry of applications from Woodridge as well. The developer tells me he's already sold a third of the parcels in that 45 parcel development. So this would be exciting times. Anything else for zoning? IT? Uh, board on page 19 is the bi weekly report. Are there any questions? I have some questions about the bandwidth. You'd mentioned about possibly having to buy more bandwidth to do the online meetings. That's correct. That's the first test we did, the preliminary results look, look good. I think uh, most of the bandwidth is, most of the traffic is going to be internal. So I don't think it's going to require us to actually purchase any new stuff, some more testing to do. But uh, uh, a couple of parts that we want to answer the order to get a little better grip uh, on how, how much we are actually using. We're going to let's test uh, probably tomorrow. So, but right now, it doesn't look like we're going to have to purchase additional bandwidth. Okay. okay. Thanks. Is there, um, I know that we, 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 do we receive free software from Green Tree or we found something similar to what Green Tree was using as far as um, tracking and, and managing our, our internal assets, resources, and traffic? Um, we're still using that. Yeah, yeah, the trial, uh, trial period, period expired, okay. so we're reevaluating that. Uh, obviously, it wasn't budgeted for this year. Okay. Um, we did have to uh, make some updates uh, in regards to the gateway. Um, that is the ability of, of the employees to be able to log in through the website. So we were <coughs> we had to, uh, and that was budgeted to to get that done. So um, it. We will reevaluate that later in uh, this year to see how if uh, some of the things that we've been budgeted and need to be replaced. So, um, I, the cost for the software is Mr. Terry. Um, I don't recall off the top of my head. I know there's some other options. Solar Winds has a product out there. And yeah, um, but it's something we're reevaluating. But uh, we want to get some of the other goals and and. Uh, okay. Was Green uh, refresh my memory? Was Green Tree willing to come back and do a no charge um, update or, or evaluation once a year, or what was? What they was they offered offer? to come in at any point to be as a member of the community to come in and do the assessment. Okay, um, but not park the software. No. Uh, here. Well, uh, they're. They do sell the software, so if we did buy the software through them, then all our service agreements would be through them. Right, but as far as what they were offering at, at no charge, it was they would they would come in once a year and do their snapshot yeah. and give us that. But then it wasn't that we could use that software at no charge throughout the year. No, it okay. was just a snapshot and assessment network uh, test assessment. So, um, and obviously the the report that we had earlier this year, um, we've completed. Pretty much all the recommendations based on that um, security. Uh, what's the what's the cost justification? Somebody's vibrating. What's the cost justification of having that software? Um, is it that it it keeps your it keeps your uptime uh, rates higher, or uh, what? Why why would how would you justify spending the money for that software? I'm just I'm, I'm asking that question. It gives you a real time. Um, it, it tests the system at, uh, in down to almost milliseconds in regards to testing the entire network. It gives you a live shot of the network and and it's supposed to update you of potential problems before they become a problem. Um, so and we did notice when we had the software on that it did slow everything down a little bit because it does take a lot of. Um, bandwidth to continually Resources. testing each machine that is as attached to the network okay. um, so was it doing remote remote diagnostics as far as antivirus as well it does antivirus it, it actually creates a, a lot of um, internal tickets trouble tickets that aren't really um, I don't see they're false positives but they they're uh, 
very low priority calls and okay. generates can bog it down. Go and set, set the settings for what you want. But, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I just didn't want to lose sight of what they did with the information right. we learned from it, and then if there was something we needed to go to another level with. <coughs> so, but if they're willing to come in and do a once a year health check, then we should at least do that at least once or twice a year, whatever they're willing to do. Some of that information it, it, that they provided, or through that software and that report, it, it doesn't change. You, you know what you right. have as far as your operating systems and your hardware. And six months later, it's just going to be six months older. So, but some of the other stuff seemed interesting to, to have available. Yeah, you have some service that in the Okay. Um, roads. Uh, thank you, Lord. The first item on the agenda is a purchase request for breathing air maintenance. And this is the annual uh, maintenance contract and uh, purchase request for one thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> Uh, make motion to approve the purchase request 00343 and renewal of the service agreement to ProAir for the semi-annual maintenance and quarter air sampling in the amount of $1,850 and authorize the Township Administrator to sign for the board. Second. Mr. Paxson. Yes. Mr. Kreps? Yes. Thank you, board. Next item on the agenda is the uh, paving project uh, for this year at the amount of two hundred and thirty thousand dollars. Sorry. Okay. Make a motion to approve purchase request zero zero three four four to John R. Jerkinson for the amount of resurfacing for the annual resurfacing program through the Cooperative Green County bid in the amount of $230,000 and authorize the Township Administrator to sign for the bid. Second. I have a question though. We budgeted two thirty, dollars um, but the bid came in at two hundred four three eighty six, and so and so we're, we're, we're issuing a purchase request to the vendor for more than they bid? We're going to go back and try to add two streets to the south off Turfland while we're there. We just okay. haven't had a chance to go out and measure and all that. But we're going to try to add while we're there, we're going to pay and then we move on to that reception. Okay, but they're at a not to, ex not to exceed 204, 386 for the work they did. Now That's you're looking correct. to see you've got dollars allocated. What else can you get done for that amount? That is correct. Okay. And it did come under bid, so. Uh, I just want to make sure I understood yeah. it because yeah. it looked a little odd. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Paxson. Yes. Mr. Kreps. Yes. Thank you, Board. Next item on the agenda is the Road Department's bi-weekly report. Um, one thing I'd like to point out is on page 24 is a, uh, just a sh small little report to the Board on some questions that came up in the previous meeting in regards to the energy audit. Uh, staff did meet with uh, Heapy Engineering. Um, we went essentially section by section of the entire uh, two reports that uh, uh, that were brought back to us uh, evaluating the administration building station 62 and station 63. Uh, we asked for some clarifications in two of the areas they are going back and reevaluating um, those and may may require them to come back out and, and shoot some uh, uh, one thing we did ask was just about the windows and um, temperature so they may have to come out and use the laser to uh, reevaluate that um, and then once they submit their final report um, we will officially accept the final report and then um, we along with, with the report we will have a form to fill out to send to uh, DPNL um, for the five thousand two hundred fifty dollars okay. and that would be for half um, and that's just completing the report for the second half to receive the other $5,250, we have to then spend um, the total amount. But as a, you can see in the report, that's going to be uh, just with some furnace work. Uh, that alone will cover the entire report. What we also discovered is anytime we make some purchases as a part of this process, we're going to be entitled to additional rebates 
uh, through DPNL and Vectron, depending on what we're purchasing, uh, as long as it meets their standards. Um, and those are purchasing rebates. So not only will we get the rebates for the, the program, um, but when we make purchases, if we're meeting to the standards of DPNL and Vectron, we may be subject to additional uh, rebates as well. Okay. As a general, um, did we learn anything from this that we didn't already know? Well, some of the things that uh, I think in the report were kind of interesting was just uh, some of the basic common practices in, in offices, um, space heaters, um, mm -hmm. power strips. Um, we, we use power strips because we do get the stations inspected by, you know, by the fire department occasionally, but, um, and we're required to use power strips. But one of the things they discussed is when we're looking at power strips, just because you have it plugged into a power strip, um, it is still trickling electricity, even though the device may be off. A major one that we uh, identified in the report were space heaters. Um, and in those space heaters, uh, they're constantly drawing power. And so one of the things they recommended was uh, the power strips that have timers on it. So it completely cuts off the appliances. Uh, some of the things that we're gonna be working with IT uh, is timeouts on screens. Uh, they evaluated our copying machines and made recommendations to the copying machines. As we know with our larger copying machines at the fiscal office in, the, in this building here, we have um, a lot of power being drawn just to be ready to make a copy. Mm -hmm. um, so we're gonna make adjustments, adjustments to those. And as uh, Mr. Parks indicated in his report, some of those things we're implementing now. Uh, timeout screens on the uh, monitor screens and those type of things. Um, the windows, we learned a lot about windows. Uh, obviously double pane windows obviously are better, uh, but there's an additional savings if you put a film on them. Um, and so even when we evaluated some of the windows in the report and had a lot of discussion with HEAPI was um, just putting the film on as opposed to replacing the windows as a, as a cost savings as well. So common practices that uh, I don't think if there's anything, uh, Chief or Mr. Parks that we, we talked about. Um, as far as like lighting goes, you already started acting that. I see you did that. Right. Placing the LEDs. Um, yeah, the payback on some of that stuff is astronomical as well. Yes. But, yeah. Uh, and one of the other things that just I don't think anybody ever thought of is one of the things they brought up was water usage. Mm -hmm. you any fountain in this building, this is two gallons a minute. Well, you can get those now with a used restrictor. Half, half. Which will save you on your water bill and your electric for the heating the hot water. Mm -hmm. That's something as time goes on, we're going to probably implement. In the near future, as long, as long along with some of the capital projects we kind of had planned for this year, as far as HVAC and CP3s and some of those, so it, it was an informative thing. Um, we, were, we actually did talk to them about since we started this in 2014. We do a lot of new three buildings a year. If this one's going to count towards those 14 markets. <coughs> They said it was, and then we go back and remind you can also hopefully, probably end of second quarter, we'll start with three additional buildings in the township to have to take a look and see where we're at. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? No. Any other questions for roads? Thank you. Thank you, board. Next item is uh, under fire department uh, is the policy. As you recall, last meeting uh, in the packet was an outline of the policy uh, on page, excuse me here, page 29 is the actual policy that will be implemented. Uh, just need a simple motion by the board to go ahead and approve the policy as presented. <coughs> if there's not any questions or changes. What, what is the percentage of false alarms um, that we encounter a, a year? It was in the last, re last meeting packet, I think it was 23%, which was um, 
And that was inclusive of medical alarms, CO alarms, and fire alarms. So it, this policy will not address any of those issues. Uh, so that was fine. Yeah, because in med medical would be the so CO alarms, it would fall in this category. No, this would be actually for uh, systems that are in place, yeah. not so much detector, like residential detector use. This will be for actual systems that are put in our, in our local businesses, or a system, I would assume, in a residential property that we continue to have. Yeah, that's what since, I read. Since we're starting to see the cost of residential sprinklers come down just with technology, um, I don't, we don't know how many we do have, I, I know personally when looking to put it in my house, it was an outrageous cost. Um, but as the price continues to come down, we're going to see more and more. And now those residential s systems uh, are not required by the fire code to be tested because um, yeah, it is residential property. And it's uh, most of those systems, well, most all those systems run off uh, residential uh, service anyhow. But if we continue to get false alarms, because you can tie those residential systems to your fire alarm system if you have that, so your, your fire security system. So, but this is mostly for our commercial uh, developments that are required to have a system in place. Uh, I read in here where it says residential. Um, the, I, the policy is for any monitor system, residential or right. commercial. Yeah, that's how so I read that. if the board wants to choose that, then we would need to make a change to how the policy is. Ohio Fire Code, um, the Unified Fire Code standard that goes along with it uh, does not differentiate, uh, or it differentiates between two types of systems, but the policy applies to both types of systems. This policy gives you, the, if I interpret this correctly, it gives you the right to and charge a false alarm fee if you have excessive false alarms at a resident at the same residence. Okay. But uh, let me point out too that the the policy is uh, to be first more educational in regards right. to educating our community, uh, whether residential or commercial development, uh, and be a little more proactive on our false alarm policies. Mm -hmm. um, how one question I had is uh, specifically, we'll just say on commercial applications. How are you? How do we communicate that the policy that there is the policy? How do we do that? Is it through a, just through through a mailing, through a, a, a media awareness? The actually the business side of it is probably the easiest because most of those systems have a permit uh, process to go through for installation, and so we'll notify them directly. And I believe that's addressed in, in here. Uh, yes through a, an informational letter. Um, and then if we go out on a, a false alarm, there would be an informational follow-up as well. Uh, for the general public, for the residential, that's a little harder because like, for example, mine's a self-installed system. Right. Um, so that'll just be through probably a newspaper article, website information, and again, In touch. if we go out, yeah, the, the first time out there is gonna be an informational, as you know, uh, and actually the second and third times are very forms of information also before it gets into any sort of penalty mm -hmm. phase. Okay. Yeah, in the possible we talk about uh, using every available local media outlet to, to right. inform the general public as a whole that yeah, social media yeah. or Facebook and Twitter and those things like that. Okay. Um, I, just had a, I just had a couple of concerns here. Um, one of them is with um, property owners. It seems, in my experience, a lot. A lot of false alarms with new systems going into place. At least it was at the mall. It was like almost three a night or something like that that I can remember. But the fee, the um, the fine is would be a bit steep, I would think. For I believe there's a provision in the Southwest uh, Unified Standard that uh, has an exemption. I think it's a 90 day exemption for new construction for a home. So there is a working out period um, that, the, and again, that was, uh, I provided a copy of all that in last week's uh, packet that I have in front of tonight, but um, I believe it's a 90 day exemption for reconstruction. And then again, the penalty phase doesn't get enacted until I believe it's the fourth false alarm, and I think it's a six month period. Um, so there's at least three points of contact prior to that to inform and educate before there's a penalty phase. So um, at that point, I guess the question is, 
should we be imposing a penalty at the fourth false alarm visit uh, in a relatively short amount of time? Yeah, now I read in your procedures here. It says um, under four, on section four, four point one point four, no fee will be assessed for the initial registration or annual registration renewals prior to multiple prior to multiple false alarms. But under four point two point two point one point one, it looks to me like, unless I'm reading this wrong, that if you went on a false alarm and they didn't, they weren't registered. That they would they would receive a hundred fifty dollar basically a fine for not registering. Is that right? No. Am I reading um, that right? You're, it's half right. I understand so what you're saying. There is a registration fee. The registration fee is to be waived for anybody who voluntarily registers. So we're not out to make money off. This is this is the first one. Um, so we'll reach out to as many people as we can. We'll use all the media and the things that we've already discussed to, to let folks know that there is a registration process. If we go out on a false alarm, first false alarm, so the, the fee is waived initially. Somebody voluntarily registers no fee at, at, at all. It is waived. Uh, and then I, I think you're right. I think it's $150. We go out on a first false alarm. We find a system that's not been registered. We notify the, the property owner. Um, they will help you fix this, we'll educate you on the problems, and oh, by the way, there is a registration process. We need you to register this so we have the information for making good contact when we do come out. And if we end up, and you can register now, the fee is still waived. If we come out a second time on an unregistered system, so they've had opportunity to register it, we've informed, uh, we've been out on the first false alarm, inform them that it's not registered, there needs to be a registration. If we go out on a second one, and they still have not registered it, at that point, we would remove the fee waiver, essentially, and charge them the registration fee. So it would be kind of a pre-penalty. Pre so we would waive it, usually we'd give them a second chance on a first false alarm. On a second false alarm or a third chance is when the registration waiver would be eliminated. And that will lead then into the penalties which come at the later point in time. So it's kind of a way to say, hey, there's a fee, we're going to waive it on good faith that you guys register it. Um, if they do it, there's no problem. We go out on a false alarm, they haven't registered it, we inform, we educate, we ask them to register it. If they do, again, no problem, fee is still waived. We go out on a second time and they haven't registered it, that's when the, the that waiver would be uh, eliminated, so they would then be required. Okay. And if, if the board's not comfortable with that provision, we can certainly take it out. Uh, what we're looking for is something between the, the Southwest standard from the Unified, I think it's the fourth visit is when the financial penalty kicks in. We were looking for something as an intermediate step. As traditional, matter of fact, I can't remember what the city of Beer Creek is. The city of Beer Creek, I think, is a hundred or hundred fifty dollar registration fee for an alarm. Um, we didn't want to impose that initially because we don't want to have a high point of entry to having uh, monitored systems. Sure. But if somebody were not to register it and we were to have repeated visits out there because of false alarms, then we wanted to have some sort of mechanism to encourage them to not only register but also maintain it properly. So that's that was the idea behind that. When you say city, do you mean the police department, false alarms, or fire department? Because uh, aren't the, don't they operate under unified fire code? Yeah, Same the, as the, the cities under that. Yes, the the uh, burglar alarms, security. Bur burglar alarms. Alarms. Okay. Okay. Um. I don't know. I guess I, I'm, I'm just concerned about number one, how big of a problem is it really? Number one, and, and how big of a. I mean, I understand the need for addressing false alarms, but in the in the scheme of things, how how many of them do we go on and fire? And we go on far more EMS. False alarms. Yeah. Boy, what I would consider false alarms and fire false alarms. Um, but um, sometimes a peace of mind for somebody is worth a lot of money. Uh, so I don't know, the, the actual fire end of it is mainly what we're trying to address here and how, how many of those we actually go on to warrant, to 
warrant you know a fees a fee structure like that so two thoughts one uh, I don't recall the number off the top of that I thought that was included in, in last meeting's packet but uh, I don't know how that from me, so I'm not sure um, but this is acting on a recommendation from the audit uh, that we went through last year so obviously it was important enough for them to identify it as a specific recommendation and we we're asked by the board to act on those recommendations since that's all we have policy here the other part of that is um, there are provisions in the, the Unified Fire Code section now that we can enforce with absent this policy. Um, and typically, I believe the Bureau does a good job of heading things off before they get to the penalty phase anyway. I agree. So mm -hmm. this, this particular policy is a little bit redundant um, with, the, with the fire code provisions we have now, what it does is it works to clear up some of the odds and ends that the, the code itself does not specifically address. Uh, in particular, the registration, the education information component, and then also the crew education, which is a component of this policy. Um, it doesn't really change the penalty section at all, quite frankly, because that's basically a legislative action that's been taken as far as adopting it. This policy can't supersede that, is my knowledge, is my understanding. So um, the, the penalties that we've been talking about are essentially there already and are typically used, but not frequently because, as you pointed out, we don't get to that point. So this addresses all of the other pieces and parts of a false alarm <coughs> policy code specifically uh, does either not address or does not specifically identify some of the different components that we've already talked about so we can we can act on it or not not act on it but again we're we brought this to the board as a result of the, the performance audit uh, at the board's direction so if you choose not to act on it that's fine we can put it on a shelf in case we need it later um, but it, you're right it does not affect we're not going to see our fine revenue go up substantially because of implementation of this. What you're going to see is a probably a better record keeping system because we'll have more information based off of the registration and then our crews will be better informed, which quite frankly we're going to do regardless of the policy implementation. Also, we'll do the education of the crews as well. So. I'll give um, maybe a little bit different perspective on it and appreciate what you're asking. In personal experience, I had an office in, in, a, in a business I own. I had an office in Indianapolis where I had multiple false alarms and I was fined um, for those going off. As a business owner, it was frustrating, but the fine forced us to take action and fix the problem. Um, last year, um, shortly after taking this seat, um, I, was, uh, I caused a false alarm at my own business that brought an engine and a, and a medic unit uh, to my business. Um, and looking at those dollars rolling down the street, uh, these these fines are minuscule in, in relation to the, the dollars that were expended, let alone if those resources were needed somewhere else um, and they were they came to a false alarm when they should have they, they when there were two incidents that happened at one time. Um, so from a business owner perspective, I would look at it and say there's a, there's enough opportunity here to fix the problem before you get a fine. Um, that the fine, I don't think, is there to generate, like you said, significant revenue. It's there to get the to get the to motivate, at least from a business perspective or residents, I guess. But from the business perspective, get them to fix the problem. Um, and, so. and, it might, and, and it probably would on a business end of it. Mm -hmm. But what it can also trigger on a residential end of it is a total disconnection of the system. The heck, but I'm not paying these funds anymore. So you have a um, and because there's no mandate to, for them to have a system in place, so that's the, that's why I said we, did, we don't do this a whole lot. I don't think that happens a whole lot, but um, in the residential side, there's not that many that I believe are out there. I mean, it, it, if you're looking at building a residential property, you know, it's it's one of those things that are on your wish list, like it was on mine when I was building my house, and then it was quickly. Uh, Deleted by the my business partner and wife, who says, "No, we would. I'd like to invest it in yeah. vaulted ceilings or a bigger basement or something like that." So um, there's not that many in residential, and and I don't see Ohio uh, getting to a point where we start requiring residential sprinkler systems as they are required out west. We're seeing a lot more communities out there requiring. Um, 
residential sprinkler systems to be installed. Can we, uh, is it logical or is it feasible, can we carve out residential from this policy um, and leave it as commercial and then monitor residential and if we have, see if we have five or if we have 25 cases of that over the next year? Well, uh, we can carve it out of the policy, but it's still covered under the unified fire right. code. So there's still a provision there for dealing with the problem. If it so, should arise, yeah, but, uh, we, but we could carve it out of this policy. Yeah, and, and my concern about carving it out of the policy, again, is the policy is based mostly on the registration information education, which are the preemptions to a uh, financial penalty. Uh, and so if we carve it out here, we lose the positive side and still keep, we lose a character we have a stick. Mm -hmm. um, and just one, one thought, uh, as you're considering uh, the point Mr. Paxley brought up is total disconnection of the system. And I would argue that, that is not necessarily always going to be a bad thing. If we have a residential system that is false alarming enough times to rise to the level of a, an issue here, it's clearly not installed or maintained properly or there is another issue and is it really doing the job it's supposed to if it's false alarming on that regularity is the first point. And the second point is, if we're going to false alarms on a regular basis, and you pointed this out, and it was also the NOVAC report, we're using resources, and even more limited resources now than even when the, the report was done, to chase down false alarms when they could be available for another real incident. Mm -hmm. um, and so if somebody, if it's the difference between a person who's causing false alarms misallocation of resources not being connected or not going on those false alarms which is the better scenario for the fire department so it's not ideal and again our goal is going to be to have the, the homeowner or business owner maintain the system properly so there are no false alarms but if we get into that position where we're on our third fourth fifth in a six month period um, is the better option to either have the penalties to enforce or to incentivize them to correct it, or to have them disconnected so that we don't have that problem. I don't know that again, I don't know that that's a bad thing is your Is your concern the monetary uh, penalty? But for the residential. For the residential. 200 bucks is uh, so, so, so if there were a differential in between residential and commercial fees, would that? Yeah, well, a small, a small business owner too. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I, and I like the, it looks like you don't, it just looks like you're working with them. You know, oh yeah. I don't like the hundred and fifty dollar thing thing of fine in there. I was gonna ask legal about fining. Can we fine people under under the, that's a township in the and require them, mandate them to register their alarms with the fire department? Well, I mean I guess it's technically not a mandate or requirement, but we're we're requesting that they uh, register, but I don't see any legal issues with that. Now. Request it, but if they don't, then they we do. have the power to fine them 150 bucks. If they have a false alarm. Let me, yeah. let me ask false something that may help this. What, what's the registration process? Um, it would be filling out uh, most likely an online form, but for people who didn't have access or didn't want to, we'd have a paper version of it that would have basically property information, contact information for the owner, and then uh, system information, contact, contact information for the monitoring company. Okay. So the things that we would need basically to, when we get called out to a scene, to be able to mitigate the system violence. Okay, so in most cases, in five minutes or less, that could be completed? I would anticipate, yeah. Okay, so in most cases, when we arrive on that second false alarm, we could have a mandatory. We could have a mandatory registration on right there. Essentially, in lieu of if you mandate, either re register it right now, or there will be a fee the next time. Yeah, and then we could add that. To Does that make sense? That we yeah. Anyway, we're we're actually being proactive. We're if if we show up and you have a register, we're gonna, it's mandatory registration at this point, or fees kick in at this point. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Thought on it. What is our? Um, I was I was thinking about a response pattern and you know business district. Do we? What is it? We spend uh, two two uh, engines on a ladder truck and uh, three engines on a ladder truck. Commercial, commercial commercial false alarm is one engine one ladder truck. One engine ladder truck. Yeah. I believe it's safe for residential. Okay, I mean, uh, commercial, commercials. Yeah, it's one engine, one ladder. I think for yeah. all the residents we get. Which is an interesting philosophical conversation we've had most of the year, uh, because, uh, yeah, I'm not bothering that, but 
there's there's been a lot of debate as to what the response level should be. We have settled on one engine, one ladder, because if the alarm turns out to be real, there's sufficient resources to at least begin initial action right. uh, as they're calling for the additional, but not so much as to drain all of the resources in the city right. the township uh, if there were a problem uh, elsewhere. And so, like, uh, you know, you could have a, a one engine, Maybe you cut your response with the first engine run emergency or second engine just on the quiet and well the truck does respond on ER. yes the truck the truck first doesn't engine responds ER, okay the yeah. truck responds on and more often than not the first arriving engine company as soon as they make as soon as they quickly make an assessment that this is there's no smoke there's no odor of smoke they quickly cancel that ladder yeah. okay. um, that's more often than not that that ladder doesn't make the scene um, it's being sent back. So what did we compromise to then? That uh, we eliminate the the hundred and fifty dollar fine if they if we do a f show up at a false alarm and it's not been registered. The, the impression I got was to uh, what 2. I had notes here was to add language that uh, would essentially the crews would assist them in registering on the second, as I think is what was said. We're talking 4.2.2.1.1, correct? It says... Yeah, 4.2.2.1.1. <laughs> so that's where we've had a second alarm. The, re the alarm was not registered, and therefore a $150 fee. Yeah, so... So in other words, you're saying, register your alarm, or you're going to get a $150 uh, bill. And uh, yeah, and then I have a note here based on the conversation is to add language that, you know, the second false alarm um, that we would, the crews would be able to register or collect the information or assist the homeowner or business owner with registering their Right. You know, we don't want to tie up a crew if they have another call right. to make. So I think if you say they have, they have 10 days from that point to register or there will be a $150 fine. Does that make sense? Because that we don't want to have them sitting there for 30 minutes filling out a form. Everybody's ability to form, fill out a form can take different degrees of time. So, but give them essentially give them a period of time to remedy it, and then before a fine would be. Because I'm assuming, I mean, honestly, the times I've had a false alarm is when I've been testing my system and I forgot that my alarm was connected to it. To a, to a dispatching yeah. and now that will be also part of the and so you hate to find somebody yeah. for testing their birth their, their fire alarm right and that will be a part of the educational process as well to to make right. sure that they inform dispatch when they're testing their system and inform that when they're done testing their system um, because sometimes that happens too is when someone says you know test and then dispatch and, and the crews get busy and somebody right. forgets to call back and the system show, still shows up in the computer as out of service for testing. Right. Do we have an inventory? Um, uh, if we were, how, how would we identify all of the businesses in the township in the unincorporated area specifically? How would we do that? Well, we currently have a permit process um, in place. Okay. So we will be able to review the permits that are in okay. the inventories in Firehouse, and we also have a permit process. Uh, and a list of businesses okay. uh, with zoning as well, and we can compare those lists. Does police require a registration process with her? You said there's a mandatory fee. The city does. I do not know if the uh, sheriff does for the township. I don't okay. Sure. I'm looking for if there's a list anywhere that we can get from one side or the other, either the sheriff or the city or from our own resources. Not that you don't necessarily want to do a mailer and the cost and expense of that, but if there's a way to... Well, there's definitely the city has an inventory, but with their uh, alarm system um, ordinances that are in place, we can compare our list with their list. But we'll check with the sheriff's office to see what they have. Okay. Actually, Green County Building uh, regulations. Yeah, that would be another one. So we could do a targeted uh, for known installations. Right. Uh, targeted mailing to uh, inform them. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you comfortable with what we ended yeah, up at? Um, I guess somewhere in there, this is just me, would like to see, I know you see it send a letter in there under 4.2.2.1.1, um, 
A friendly letter? Yes. I don't think they're friendly letters. Actually, I'd like to see a, somebody make a phone call with that person, you know, and and um, and, and talk to them because you might get information and might say, you know, we've been having. You never know. You might find out a personal situation. Um, and maybe develop a little more understanding of, of somebody's under of somebody's situation through a phone call or even a visit, if you can, to the person who's responsible for that alarm system in that building. So a letter's nice and all that, but if it starts to get to a problem, a problem level, then maybe a phone call or a visit or a, you know, a meeting someplace to talk about the situation. Uh, to render the problem that way as opposed to getting a letter in the mail. It sounds like maybe we can just add in there that we communicate, we, 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 we attempt to reach or contact the property owner, um, but I think you do have to memorialize it with something in writing right. um, so that you have justification to do the next step if you yeah, need to. That, so the, the letter's important. So there's, a good, there's a community yeah. goodwill component, and I think yeah. that's what Mr. Baxson is saying. That we, there should be an outreach. Of, Sometimes, if you you, know, if you mail, where, who do you mail the letter to at Germain, um, for for example? Is it really going to get to? How, how do you know who to get that letter to? Well, that, that's the whole purpose of the registration process. Exactly. <laughs> I understand. So it's easy when it's a house, um, or it's easier, I should say. But when it's a large business, uh, if it's the Unison plant, how do you know who to who to contact? Who's the right person to even talk to there? If the, so, I. Yeah. I Okay, that's all. That's all. So maybe it's more—it's a practice standpoint that we we attempt to contact uh, the property. That's owner. how I would like to see it. it just and just follow and follow up with a letter. Yeah. Good point. The uh, only thing I'd like to point out is, I, at this point in time, I don't think there's a huge number of these that we're, we're going to be talking about. So it's probably not too big a deal. But the Fire Prevention Bureau is one of our most understaffed resources in the department. So the additional context that we put on them, I understand the value of it, but it could pretty quickly overwhelm them depending on how this were to go long term. So at some point we may come back to you and say this isn't feasible. Can we Hopefully this begins to lower the number of false alarms that are preventable. Uh, thank you, board. Next item on the agenda is the bi-weekly report. If there's any questions, we'll be happy to discuss them. No, the only, uh, it was ironic, um, sadly ironic, I had met uh, a couple folks from the auxiliary the morning of the 14th, I believe it was, um, and they said that they had not been on a call yet this year. Now there have been two since, yes, including sir. one that day. So I'm not going to meet with them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading about the auxiliary, uh, and in there it mentions about the deployment outside of the community. Um, what, what, um, what do you have in mind with that? I guess deployment for is that, CERT? that type of resource, huh? Is that cert related? Is it cert related or is it is it auxiliary related? Yeah, go ahead. There's, yeah, there's kind of two components. Three three related issues. One is um, a general conversation that occurred at the Green County Chiefs meeting in which um, a question was asked of who had that type of resource that wasn't available, um, which uh, led into a conversation with auxiliary leadership. Um, Auxiliary, now that we have a CERT component, uh, we, we're looking at it in two different ways. The on-scene support slash victim assistance asset part of it, um, we have rolled out, I think, two or three times outside of the boundaries of Beaver Creek. And those have all been times when our crews have been mutual aid. So they've supported our crews on a mutual aid call. And at this point in time, that's 
generally what we're going to maintain as our accepted practice. So if our crews are out there and there's a need for them, the auxiliary will still respond much as they would like an incident inside of Beaver Creek. Um, it would be a different geography, obviously, but our crews would be supported along with whatever much they cruise. Um, and there would be our folks on scene uh, as far as incident management and all the things that are related to oversee their uh, safety and well-being. So, um, that's the only time they would go mutual aid uh, in an on-scene uh, support or victim assistance role. CERT is a, um, an organization is designed more as a county resource uh, or even a regional resource. Um, and matter of fact, a lot of the training funding, training funds are coming from the county level. So um, if there were a large-scale incident, CERT could be deployed independent of the fire department or the auxiliary proper. So people who are CERT trained could be uh, activated by Green County EMA or even state level resources potentially. Um, and at that, at that point, they would be part of that emergency response, not necessarily part of the Beaver Creek umbrella. Um, but again, that's the difference between CERT members of the auxiliary and on scene or victim assistance support members of the auxiliary. So, uh, we're still working out the details of how all of that works specifically. Uh, we don't even have our first uh, CERT training class until early June. Um, and so we'll have uh, several more meetings between that and that. Um, who exactly is in that uh, function area and how they can be identified, how they can be dispatched. Uh, but it is not the auxiliary, as we know it traditionally, that would be deployed to, say, Senior Jamestown or Fairborn or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, it was my question. Is anything around that is cost and deployment and all of that? And then the biggie, I guess, is is this: is if we have a CERT team, well, let's just say they go deployed outside of Beaver Creek as an auxiliary or a CERT team. How are they covered under the Bureau of Workman's Compensation? How are we covering them as employees? Are they now considered a volunteer responder, first responder? How is that covered under this whole umbrella of employee? If they are, if, so to go to the first point, if uh, there is, let's say, a three alarm fire, which was the last deployment outside Beaver Creek that I know of, um, that they went to Xenia on a three alarm fire. Now we had uh, an engine crew, a ladder crew, uh, medic crew and a, and a battalion chief all there so the, the, when they responded there they're under Beaver Creek Township's umbrella if they get deployed now if we know we talk about CERT that's kind of a different program yeah. altogether if they are called upon uh, by the on a county emergency so in other words the, the and there's a secession so that let's say if there's a disaster in Fairborn and the city of Fairborn says we're now declaring this as a disaster and the county comes in and says, we agree, we're now declaring a county disaster, and they request, the county requests certain team members throughout the county. That is a county asset and resource and falls under the county umbrella. If the state of Ohio then comes in and says it's a state of emergency, um, then it's under the state's emergency management and falls under that umbrella. So uh, they would no longer, if they are deployed under CERT, if they're deployed under a county response or a state response, and eventually a FEMA response uh, as a state resource, that, that is covered under those jurisdictions. And it is important um, in regards to the paperwork to make sure, because that is, those layers need to be filled out. Those need to be resolutions by the county, the state, the governor needs to declare. And that because of those declarations, it opens up not only money from Superfund money to come in, but it also, everyone working as volunteers uh, and CERT will be covered under that umbrella. So the CERT and, CERT and auxiliary are two different programs. Yeah, it's managed under the township as one. Um, and and the CERT team members will also be auxiliary members, but not necessarily auxil all auxiliary members will be CERT team members. Right. Okay, so um, so it will be a local resource for us to assist the crews and victims at, under the auxiliary. CERT is just an additional training. The idea of CERT uh, is for everyone in the community to go through the class because what 
it really pushes uh, the education is is how to respond at home how to take care of your family your neighbors not as a resource but things to identify if for example there's a wind event or a tornado and that's what that's the most of the majority i can't remember the last time a cert was deployed in this county uh, on an actual disaster there have been times when cert was considered to be for like for example uh, a lot of the lost person searches um, a lot of the county cert team members are trained at lost person search mm -hmm. uh, and in the and unfortunately in those um, you know you have law enforcement you have local fire jurisdictions being called and really you don't need police cars and fire engines you need people to do the search that are trained so they've been considered a couple times by local fire chiefs to deploy the cert teams for to assist in search but by the time we got to that level the victim was found so um, yeah so there's two kind of two different umbrellas one if it's a resource that we're using the auxiliary would be covered under the township. If there's a state or county disaster, they would fall under that. And it's not a requirement that they go. It's strictly a 100% voluntary uh, deployment. Have, uh, have we clearly communicated to our auxiliary members that being a member of auxiliary does not cover them when they're on a CERT activity? For a disaster response, they'll learn that in the class, yes. Okay. Yeah. So we just need to make sure that we we've communicated that right. to them in writing um, yeah. that they need to seek those protections from the county or whatever organization yeah. they're, they're and supporting it, and it wouldn't be us calling them i understand but just yeah. so there's not yeah. an implied yeah so it, just so they understand the, yeah. the delineation between the two now if we have a local disaster that does not require a state of a county state of the emergency then they would fall under and if and if the city or the township the township fire department decided to deploy cert they would be covered under us hmm. if it was for a local so disaster that's my question. so but it's no different than auxiliary being being called out right now for to to go to a fire scene so but you could be potentially calling somebody from xenia or fairborn who's a member of cert to respond to something in beaver creek township mm -hmm. so okay and, and if you did, if you did that on a local level that would never be that would be covered under our umbrella so right they still for to be a member of our cert they have to be a member of auxiliary and to, to go under to be a member of our auxiliary they have to um, go through our process of um, essentially hiring to be a part of the auxiliary so I mean they still it's not like some of the cert team uh, that are out there and, and most of them are not active anymore but some of the local cert teams um, at least in this area, uh, where you just sign up to cert, go through the class, and you're automatically on the team. We still go through our, our process, uh, as we always been, to have members on our auxiliary. And the good thing, or I guess a good report, is we're starting to get more citizens wanting to be a part uh, of the fire department's operations. Um, and right now, our membership is up to 41 volunteers. Um, Let me ask you this, Tricia. Uh, if a auxiliary member was to step off the uh, uh, their vehicle over there and step in a hole and break their leg, um, forbid, how would that individual be covered? Your workman's compensation. Your workman's compensation. We had an injury earlier this year um, that one of the trainings is covered completely under our process and our policy. So um, they did the drug test, they did the medical evaluation, they did the same thing as any of our other employees would. Okay. Would that put us in another risk category? What's that? So the auxiliary is 40 people. I mean, you're talking 40 people right under this. Well, I would. I, I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean, uh, 41. Yeah, I don't think it will change our numbers in regards to BWC because that is based on. Yeah, we have to list the numbers. Yeah, they are listed as employees of the township. They're volunteer employees. But they're in a separate category from the first responders. So right. They are a cheaper asset from the the way BWC categorizes. They're weighted at a different yes. as far yes. as the the cost per. Yeah, they're under the kind of volunteers. You know, Okay. And the, the training is scheduled um, 
June 6th and June 13th. Um, I'll provide a little more information. Uh, obviously on the 13th will be the completion of the training and I'll um, definitely let the board know if they would like to come out and be a part of the uh, handing out their certificates of completion. Okay. Any, any other questions in regards to the bi-weekly report? Lieutenant Hawker uh, completed. Yes, she completed uh, the Ohio Executive <laughs> Fire Officer class. Uh, we are coordinating a time where she is uh, going to come in and make a presentation to the Board of Township Trust. Offer congratulations to her as well. It's not an easy program to get through. Uh, saw her last week. Congratulated her on that. She's and, very happy. Yeah. So. Great. We look forward to hearing from the. the there's always a question of what value do you really get out of that training, yeah. so it'll be great to hear from you. Yeah, no, we've, we've, so, we've even... You know, I'm not looking for a marketing pitch. I'm just no. looking for... <laughs> yeah, it. yeah we've talked to not anyone who's gone through the Ohio Executive Fire Officer class to come and make a presentation uh, to the Board of Township Trustees. Good. Okay. Anything else fire-related? Mm -hmm. Legal advisor? Um, I have nothing at this time, but I will say I was at a... Uh, a charity function this weekend for um, Twig Terrific Women in Giving, and there was some of the Beaver Creek Fire um, fighters that were there assisting at the charity function. I know they were very helpful, and it was much appreciated. So. Yeah, I believe that was the uh, local uh, doing that as part of their uh, outreach. So uh, great. Good. Appreciated. Mr. Paxson. Nope. And that uh, Miss Aaron's. I don't have anything. Okay. The only thing I wanted, I forgot to bring it up earlier, is um, OhioCheckbook.com, Open Checkbook. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple different resources out there. We had discussions. I think I, I forwarded something about this maybe a month or two ago. Uh, we already, that was, that's a generic letter that was sent out. We sure. were already, along with Sugar Creek Township, we were the first people to submit we were before the curve we have everything turned in there's nothing for okay. us to do at this so point so is our checkbook online can it be viewed the information i don't know the answer to that question okay. but the information that they requested from us was given to them months ago okay um, on their side i don't think that they're at a point where they have it online yet okay what's the difference between that one and open gov yeah, because I get 25 emails a I week. I think it's the same. They've rolled it into, it's one started yeah. out, One's it a started out open service. text, and then it, they've rolled it together. Um, yeah. It's a big push to, to get all, everybody's books. Uh, I understand that. I'm saying as far as the the visibility or the cost structure to participate. Okay. The, yes, there, and there's been some updates uh, to that as well, and, I, and Ms. Aarons and I had a conversation last week on this, and uh, we're going to meet to discuss the uh, our options on both OpenGov as well as um, Open Checkbooks. Open Checkbooks, uh, first of all, the, the Treasurer's Office is working and currently, and they're about to sign a contract with OpenGov uh, to help OpenGov set up the Open Checkbooks process through the, uh, the State Treasurer's Office. Um, it will not be the full. Uh, program it would be more of a read only so for example as Miss Aaron said Beaver Creek Township was one of the first to provide that information to the treasurer's office uh, the state treasurer's office um, they it's a essentially a read only PDF so anything we send them would be a read only PDF OpenGov is a software um, that there is an annual cost for that um, puts it in a web-based format and it interprets the data that we send them to make it, how do I put this, uh, easier for the public to understand uh, how we spend their money. Um, it has charts, graphs, tables, and you can click on any chart, graph, bar graph. You can even, you can actually, as a citizen, if you don't like pie charts, you can switch to linear. You can switch it, I mean, you can change the data the way you want to read it. You can also click on a bar and it'll take you to the information uh, that you're requesting. And it, it goes into detail uh, about that. The nice part also about OpenGov is that information is access, accessible not only for the public but as well as for the township 
where we can use some of that data in reports for, for and it does forecasting as well. It does a lot of forecasting. Um, now, OpenGovs will set that up with the local jurisdictions. Now, there is a cost. Now, right now, the treasurer's office with working with OpenGov uh, is also setting up as a part of their agreement between the two of them is to offer it to local jurisdictions, OpenGov, at a discounted rate. And essentially, uh, from the presentation I sat through, uh, they would be waiving the setup fee. That the state would cover the state setup fee for OpenGov. So uh, this is something that uh, Miss Aaron's and I have uh, discussed. We, I think it's uh, valuable. It would be something that would be linked through our website. Um, and they would be accessible. Now, uh, it would also be linked to both. You would be able to link it, click on there and get the information off the treasurer's office website on open checkbooks if we chose not to do with OpenGov. If we went with OpenGov, you would have both links uh, there on the website to, go, to either take you to OpenGov or to open checkbooks. But all that information will be there in whatever format uh, that the community would like to see. Okay, so in the light we'll call it light version, the free version, you essentially, you can put your budget up and you can, then they can see a ledger, I assume, and they then, they, then they can do the math. Mm -hmm. That's right. Is that pretty much? Okay. Pretty much. So that's, they have that's, the financials, they, yeah. You, give, you put all the information out there, it's up to them to interpret, and then, and then so the other one is more intuitive, but there's a fee associated to it. There's so an annual fee. What's the cost of providing the information then? The annual cost for OpenGov um, is about $9,000 when we looked at it previously, um, when we got all the emails from OpenGov. Um, but with the discounted rate, it'll probably be, um, and when that's not finalized yet, but once it comes out, it, what they're telling me is uh, potentially about 7,000 a year annual fee for OpenGov. For us to participate or to be a member to No, to for us access. to participate oh, and have access and allow our citizens to have access as well. Okay. Uh, if you would like to look at OpenGov, uh, currently, um, oh, Huber, Heights, Huber Heights, Huber Heights, Huber Heights yeah. you can click on Huber Heights uh, website mm -hmm. uh, and, and you'll see both links. Mm -hmm. um, Troutwood is currently in the setup process. Uh, I don't know of any townships in Ohio that are currently on OpenGov. Sure. We were the first to get the information. There's As indicated by the treasurer's office to me, we were the first to get the information of the state treasurer. I guess my personal opinion is it would be, it's our, it's our I think we have a duty to, to post up what we do. I don't, I don't know how far you have to go to create charts and graphs and pie charts for when, when there's a cost associated to it. Plus, you're also relying on a third party service to interpret it correctly. And misinterpretation can be worse than. Um, so, they, but take a look at both. See it. They're yeah, available, we'll see it. and we're going to continue to look at it, uh, all the options. But obviously, we've already submitted to the treasurer's office uh, okay. checkbooks. All right. Uh, any, there were no legal invoices Not this, this time? Okay. And we have an executive session on here. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion to go into executive session for ORC 121.22 G1 to consider the compensation of public. Second. Mr. Paxton? Yes. Mr. Kretz? Yes. 